Hello, good evening, and welcome. I'm Simon Bestwick. And I'm Gemma Files, and this, of course, is No Darkness, but ours. Ali Wilkes' first novel, All the White Spaces, A Tale of Terror, set in the Antarctic, was one of the subjects discussed in our very first podcast. Her second novel, Where the Dead Wait, stays with the theme of polar terror, this time in the icy wastes of the Arctic, and we are absolutely delighted to have her on the podcast to talk about it and about her work. Uh, so without further ado, here is the second part of our interview with Ali Wilkes, here on No Darkness But Ours. So it's something that um, that occurs to me, uh, the first book, uh, All the White Spaces, is about Antarctica, and the second book is about the Arctic. And um, with the Arctic, we, of course, think about the terror. Um, and one of the things that we talked about in, in that episode, when we were talking about um, polar horror, cold water, cold weather horror, um, was the idea that... Um, Antarctica is a place where nobody lives. And, yeah, yes, and we think, and at the time, people thought of the Arctic as being the same. But of course, it wasn't. People did live there. <laughs> and, and the, uh, you know, and, and part of the tragedy of, of the terror in the Erebus is that if they had asked the people who lived there how to survive there. <laughs> they would... I say, oh, chap, is there anything to eat around here? <laughs> yeah, if they'd, if they'd made any attempts yeah. to conduct an expedition, the only way such an expedition could have been conducted by using the John Ray model, in which you use um, the indigenous guides um, to show you how to survive out there. And then Fast forward to hundreds of years later when they were looking for the Erebus and the Terror, you know, yes. they were found right where, right where they were meant to be. And yeah, right you know, where the indigenous people yes, told you they were. Yes, you, you could have asked them at any point, <laughs> but never mind. Yeah. Um, never mind yeah, indeed. I think so, it's, which it, is us... a, it is such a tragedy. You've got this sort of recurring narrative of these huge groups of white people invading the homeland, the territory and the birthright of indigenous people and then just getting fucked up by it yeah. and then blaming the place, yeah. um, which is which is just monstrously unfair. Um, I wanted to address some of that in Where the Dead Wait. Um, I think it's it's probably going a bit far to say that they thought there was no one there because in Victorian England there was an entire romanticised idea of the natives of the Arctic um, mm -hmm. you know, using names that I won't use here. Mm -hmm. and the North kind of uh, narrative. Yes, and uh, there was a name given to the indigenous people and there were um, the, the iconography of say an igloo or hunting by a uh, a breathing hole in the ice and the parkers, etc. The iconography would have been readily recognisable to almost any Victorian school child. So there was a narrative about peoples in the Arctic, but the narrative was, as one can expect, that they were that that, that they were primitive and um, that they were either in the way or inconsequential, because that's how that's how empires thought and. That's how empires really still think, I think. Um, yeah. It's one of the one of the things that ruined Charles Dickens for me for life was his reaction to the entire Franklin fiasco, because he was um, quite good friends with um, Lady Jane Franklin. And he was one of the chief sort of whitewashers of what had actually happened with the Franklin expedition because as soon as John Ray came back from the Arctic he was a Scottish fur trapper who from the Orkneys who mm -hmm. you know lived amongst the uh, indigenous people and adopted their ways and as a result was a hell of a lot more effective for it but he came back to London he was like I've spoken to these people who have amazing oral narratives everything stacks up here are the relics here's this here's that look here's what happened they they're all dead and they ate each other mm. and 
of course, that rocked Victorian London. The idea of upstanding white Christians um, acting in such a way was absolute anathema. And one of the people who really engaged in the propaganda machine was Charles Dickens in his magazine Household Words mm. and also in various letters to newspapers. And he had the temerity to turn around and pin it all on the Inuit peoples. He had the temerity to turn around and say, oh, all these gnawed bones you're finding. I know who did that. It must have been the savages that killed and ate Franklin's men, which is just the precise opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Third, given given what we know about aid that was surely given. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's there's a lot of very wrong headed thinking around that time. And I wanted to play with some of that in Where the Dead Wait by having an indigenous character or several yes. indigenous characters, but one main speaking part on board the ship. Yeah. And uh, also to further um to further I don't know, to further diversify the narrative sounds really cheesy, but to further sort of think about these juxtapositions of civilization and in inverted commas versus non-civilization to highlight the role that black whaling captains had in the American whaling fleet at the time yeah. because yeah. you make a very solid argument that the real hero of the book is Captain Nathaniel. Absolutely. Right. About the whole Dickensian whitewashing thing I mean that's kind of I mean very much blown out of the water in, in many ways in in this particular narrative because they can't claim that the uh, the 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 Inuk at at them all because some survivors came back in this particular expedition yeah we at them mm -hmm. yeah yes and to a certain extent also I wanted to show some of the the real things that went on in expeditions that were forced to resort to cannibalism. And it is a horrible truth of survival cannibalism. I'm thinking of things like the whale ship Essex and also the Greeley expedition. It was often the people of colour that died first, um, often because of um, because they were less well equipped bodily to survive difficult conditions, uh, fewer fat stores and less less reserves to draw on. But also, I think, because of plain racism. I, I, I genuinely think that there was racism at work in them normally being the first to die and the first to be eaten. And so I spin off that with um, several incidents that happen at Day and Stephen's gruesome Camp Hope. Yeah. An, ironic, um, an extremely ironic name. As, uh, well, um, I, I love these. Um, I love these ironic names. I have to say, <laughs> it's um, it's you know, in in Arctic exploration, there are just all these really like you know, names that just. So I've I've got God saves harbour, which I've obviously made up, but like there is a real thank God harbour up there. <laughs> and various other things and Cape Verdant, which is deeply sarcastic, is a riff, yes. off, <laughs> is a riff off Cape Sabine and various other places um, encountered by the Greeley expedition. Nice. Yeah. I, mean, um, I, I really loved the juxtaposition of uh, this hyper male um, expedition with these two female characters. Um, and, you know, to some degree, it's, it's very it's, it's, it's very funny to me how Avery, who is, um, you know, kind of small and dapper and, you know, kind of soft, you know, yeah. is, is, is immediately soft. read by William Gay. You know? He's like, yeah. oh, you're one of those fellows, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Avery yeah. is too soft, too good. Yeah, exactly. And um but, you know, so you've got all of uh, the spirit medium um, with her veil and her skull, which we later yeah. find out. That's her, her, her incredible outfits. I yes. Mean, lacy fingerless gloves, the veils with dead moths pinned into them. Uh, Honestly, I would wear any one of those. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and I would totally wear them on that expedition because it would keep the dudes away. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Yeah, it's well, like that into well, just to attract the ghost of, them, of everybody's mom. You know? Yeah. Uh, but Keela, um, man. Oh yeah. Uh, I, you know, I was hoping 
that you you would have an an indigenous character, and Kayla was everything that I wanted her to be. Oh, I'm I'm so glad, and I've um, put it put in the acknowledgements. But I want to shout out live to my amazing sensitivity reader who helped me with the portrayal of Kayla, and in particular with her appearance because um, I found it very hard finding archive material which would show me what a young woman in her position would dress like and do her hair like and so on uh, and that actually became quite important to the narrative as it went along so yeah brilliant it's it's good to work with people on things like this it's absolutely true um so yeah the you know it's just ah, they're just really great books what is it that draws you about cannibalism in the cold Hmm. Well, um, with the cold, um, I think it's that I'm a massive survival, survival horror, horrible survival expedition narratives geek. And I have been since I was very young. You know, I'm I'm I was that kid at school who was really obsessed with the Uruguayan flight disaster. You know, there's oh, wow. always there's always one, isn't there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I went on, you know, the Dyatlov Pass, um, all the heroic age of Antarctica, um, just fascinated by these sort of horrible narratives. And I just always sort of, it's not that I always knew I wanted to write a book about them. It's that if you scratched me, it was deeply unsurprising that that was what came out. Yes. And yeah. the sequence of events I, I know it seems a bit silly, maybe, or a little unusual to have Antarctica and then Arctic, you know, back to back, almost, oh. particularly when the books don't otherwise have anything to do with each other, really. Um, they're, they're in conversation, they're not a duology. Um, but I really did write all the white spaces and thought, I wish I could have put in scurvy and cannibalism and the spirit wrapping craze and all of these other things and polar bears my god i didn't you know you can't have polar bears in antarctica because no, that's can. what the name means the name literally antarctica, means no where bears, the bears just... are not so so i i really did sit down and think what are all the things that i would just be crazy to move on without including in another book and i wrote a massive long list of them thought of who I thought would be an excellent main character, which is someone who's been hurt by the Arctic once before, and someone who's got a bitter rival, bitter rival, sorry, or a lover or a friend he has to rescue. Or and I was just like, excellent. Yeah, here we go. Here's, here's that chap. I'm going to call him William Day, and he's going to have a rough time of it because I've got a lot to fit in here. Yes. You were saying that you didn't consider it as a duology, but I mean, they both of them seem to inhabit a sort of alternate time hmm. is it the same alternate timeline or two different ones and do you ever do you, do you think there's more in that sort of sort of alternative timeline for you to explore i think you could take your pick as to whether it's the same or different really um i'm a great believer in doing what you need to get the story told and yes. in the, in all the white spaces i knew that i was going to be writing a shackleton-esque expedition around the time of Shackleton and I was either going to have to have Shackleton as a character or deal narratively with why Shackleton wasn't there and yeah. so I, I'm afraid I took the simplest course which is to write him out and write someone else in and similarly with Where the Dead Wait there are real people name checked in the book you know people do dwell on what happened to Franklin of course yeah. um, but there's a sort of imagined timeline of exploration um, that allows me to make the Arctic or the Antarctic as it is not quite so crowded. You know, you don't want yeah. it like Heathrow Airport in there with all these. Oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the so, whole yeah. point is it is basically like this wilderness where you just go out and it is you against the. Uh... Yeah. yeah, I mean, I did originally when I was writing very early drafts of all the white spaces, I think right up until copy editing had lines in in which Jonathan Morgan thought with a shiver of the horrible story of William Day, who went to the Arctic and ate his own men twice. And <laughs> I thought about leaving that in as a fun Easter egg for anyone who read both and could see that the story was both 
as horrible and not as horrible as that. <laughs> yeah. but, but in the end, I, I decided it, it really did. It felt a bit egotistical mm -hmm. <laughs> to have my debut yeah. novel shout out a character from a second novel that I had not yet finished writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I like, I like, do you think that maybe you do that for in future, if there's in future editions, maybe sort of like the, re the revised and expanded version? <laughs> it, would, it would be fun because I would love the idea that Jonathan Morgan, who is a polar geek, who has mm. read all the books that I yeah. have read and more and is fascinated by the history of the Poles, would manage to get William Day's story really quite so wrongheadedly wrong. That that would just yeah. me, I'd be like, what did you expect, William Day? You're a loser. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes right. I'm not going to end up like William Day. That yeah, yeah no, no one wants to end up like William Day. Um, <laughs> which which I, I, I quite like the thought of it because Where the Dead Way isn't a book, I think, with an easy ending. And I don't think Day has an easy character ending either. Um, and I wanted to leave certain things very much unsaid, but certain things very brutally said uh, as yeah. well. I, I didn't want there to be a sense of a neat and easy uptick at the end. No, there definitely isn't that. Um, he's, <laughs> that is true. I think there's been a, there's a movement in Day in that he's a lot of his problems stem from being overly concerned with what the outside world thinks. Mm will think of him and trying to conceal what he really is or put the and if if there's a movement if there was a redemptive move a redemption arc to him it's kind of reaching the point where he accepts himself and it's kind of I don't want to sound like a line from uh, the Lacage of Fall but where he can't just go I am the, you know I am what I am kind yeah. of yeah and, exactly. and that he doesn't care what people think anymore yeah he cares what he thinks of himself yes, in exactly. the end and all the sort of buried trauma that he's been suppressing not very well um, no. <laughs> throughout all the years previously all the, the trauma is still there it doesn't magically go away um it's still there but he's gonna have to live with it and he's gonna have to find strategies to deal with it when i was writing it i think in my very early notes i wrote something like give it a babadook ending because i love the ending of the babadook yeah so yeah. profoundly where she is taking those bowls of worms down the stairs to the babadook because you can't get rid of the babadook nope you yes. just can't you you just can't you just got to deal with it you yeah. keep it in the cellar and feed it occasionally <laughs> yeah. and i think that's that's probably what day does isn't it yeah yes i think that is exactly what he does <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're in danger of veering into perhaps a little too into spoilery territory. Okay. This is a trouble. Um, you, you you really want people to to to, to enjoy this the way. Yeah. You know, yes. Absolutely. At the same time, you want to talk about how awesome how awesome the journey was and uh, how much you. I mean, what one thing I wanted to say. I mean, because um, we've, we've we've talked um, uh, in the past to uh, Hayley Piper, um, mm. US, and who's who's sort of uh, Twitter uh twitter bio basically reads make got make horror gay as fuck um and i think in, in some ways that, 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 that could almost be you as well but i think doing it in, in quite different ways um something Haley said when we interviewed her was i think a profound chord which was you know you're you know you, you have this we've we, we given this idea of you know civilization of culture as this bright shining light um but if you're if you're queer if you're if you don't fit in with with the with it, with its idea, its idea of what you should be, that light is very cruel, and the darkness looks like a pretty good place, and chaos can seem a pretty good thing, and tearing the the citadel down seems like a pretty good thing. Whereas in your stuff, it's more it, 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 you're dealing with these very, with, with these queer characters, but they're essentially trying to find some sort of some sort of space to occupy mm. in that yes. in that yeah. thing, rather I than sort of. I think that comes from a sense I get about history, which is that the corners of empire and the boundaries of empire would often be people where, would often be places, sorry, where people who didn't necessarily conform to the dominant narrative might find themselves and might carve out a space on the margins. Yeah. It's yeah. very, very much what queer people do today and what queer people have always done. So. I'm interested in these exploration narratives in part because they give a little bit of breathing space 
to imagine different ways of life for various people. And that's what draws my protagonists to them. And also, I think probably what draws me as a queer writer to them as well, these ways of inserting difference into the narrative. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, I mean, that's gonna... always been the lure to me of uh, of the Western. Um, the idea that you go, you you push yourself to the frontier and the frontier keeps on pushing itself further. So there's always some place for you to go, supposedly, um, to be the be whoever you are. <laughs> you know, it's like when people start to get too close, then you move further. Um, but of course, then you've also got manifest des- destiny and all the off- awfulness of that. Um, well, as we know from the film Ravenous, manifest yes. destiny turns you gay. <laughs> That's right. Turns you cannibalism, ca- uh, cannibal and gay. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, yes, one of my favorite films of all time. <laughs> Same. I absolutely love it. Just, he could monologue at me anytime. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. And, and it... you just be Guy Pierce sitting there going. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting looking at these sort of the, I mean, you, you've taken these very, uh, I mean, both of you, really, the, with the Western and, and the, the whole politics, you both take on a traditionally very hyper-masculine kind mm. of narratives mm. of, you know, tough guys doing manly dudes, doing manly things kind of thing, yeah. and um, uh, queered them mightily. Um, of course, to an extent, the queerness was always there, because, as you say, a lot of yes. the people who are going to be pushed to kind of go and explore the mind and go push out beyond civilization into the the wilderlands or whatever are people who are maybe not as at home in them in the comfortable city it's kind of like the sam peckinpah thing of you know all the of the of uh, in, in reverse almost of the you know the, the, all these tough gunslingers and stuff who are suddenly out of place in the uh when when you know as the world becomes civilized and it's kind of like well no, the, the world was already civilized we just fucking couldn't stand it and be pissed off to go and you know yeah basically in the mountains kind of thing yeah because uh, yeah. it's more fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when it, when when you when you think about huge groups of um, people who are all the same gender or identify as the same gender, it's sort of like, why do you want to hang around together? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's <laughs> yeah, an inherent you know. homoeroticism baked into a lot of these scenarios. That's exactly oh, God, yeah. that's, that's that's exactly that's it. Um, oh, no. It's the same thing that I find in um, I, at the moment. I'm wrestling with a a, a narrative set in a convent. Um, and I find it with that as well. You know, it's like, why would you choose to be a nun? Well, I don't know. Maybe I don't want to have sex with a guy. <laughs> you know, maybe I don't want to have kids. Dicks, maybe I don't you know? want to. Maybe I want to do other stuff. <laughs> the life of the mind. I, um, I remember having a conversation with um, another writer, Jasper Bark. There was a an anthology I was in some about ten years ago now called Tales of the Nun and Dragon. Mm. Um, the Essential premise was you could write any kind of story you wanted. It just had to have either a nun or a dragon, at least at least one of the two. And I I wrote uh, the, the I, I I was kind of joking when I used the words hot nun on dragon action. Um, but then again, that in the end, that's what my story ended up involving. Mm. Um, but Jasper Bark was, uh, wrote one set in a convent, and he was he talked to about how certainly in the Middle Ages, um, a convent was often. Um, I don't know if it was actually if it was so much a, a sexual a thing about sexuality. It was it was a way for uh, a woman who had a mind of her own and who was interested mm-hmm. in yeah. the arts and culture to actually have a life of her own, not have to get married off and become like a baby making machine for some um, yeah. for some nobleman. Um, one of one of the uh, first uh, people who compiled the library in the UK was was a nun. Uh, was the head of a convent, um, and of course Hild- Hildegard of Bingen as well. Of course, uh, to me is well, like the, all- the standard. <laughs> you know, it's like come to my convent. We you know we come have on, music on. and yeah. poetry and science. <laughs> I mean, some of it might not necessarily be religious at all. It might just yeah. be I would like to learn how to read and not die in childbirth at fourteen. Yes. Which yes. I think are two laudable aims. Yes, yeah. I, I believe this as well. And for and for Jonathan, it's like I would like to climb as much as humanly possible and, yeah. and see Antarctica. Yeah. yeah, he loves his climbing. Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't want the, And I wear really want nice my, sweaters. Yeah. Really oh, nice sweaters. sweaters. See, see, this is this is me getting in all the things I like because <laughs> um, 
chunky sweaters as well. I love knitting and I like knitting You're a big fan of the killing, I bet. (laughs) I like anything with a good knit. So people tend tend to wear nice knitwear in my books. And the climbing sort of snuck up on me in that when I was researching all the white spaces first, I wanted to see how easy it was for someone um, assigned female at birth to pick up climbing ropes and climbing right. the rigging and stuff like that. And I, I knew that they weren't going to let me like go out on a tall ship or yeah. whatever, like with no experience. So I did what I considered like a reasonable research trip and went down to my local circus school and took a taster in silks and rope. Nice. Um, in which I learned to climb ropes and things like that. And six years on, that's now my main hobby. I now spend a vast proportion of my time hanging from <laughs> ropes upside down off the ground. Ali Wilkes' second novel, Where the Dead Wait, was published in the US on 5th of December 2023 by Atria Books and is out from Titan Books on the 23rd of January 2024 in the UK. And we'll be back at the same time next week with the final part of our conversation with Ali Wilkes. But until then, I have been Simon Bestwick. I remain Gemma Files, and this, of course, is always no No darkness, darkness. but ours. Uh.